with his daddy cop walk and his daddy cop arms and his daddy cop butt. Ow! Press me. Make it sexy. What? It's catchy. This video is sponsored by and available on Nebula. This is The Rookie, an ABC cop procedural that follows the 45-year-old officer John Nolan, the oldest cop in the history of the Los Angeles Police Department. Played by the ever-boyish Nathan Fillion, Nolan has moved cross-country following his divorce to fill the gaping void caused by his midlife crisis with a police badge and a gun. Yes, that is, that is actually the premise of this show. I am, I'm not even hamming it up. I hate what you represent, a walking midlife crisis. You see, the LAPD isn't a place for you to find yourself. The Rookie is bad. I'm not gonna be around the bush today. It's a bad TV show that I watched for you. It's like when your cat shows up at your feet with a little critter they killed as a gift for you. You're welcome. And now this is your problem too. I broke my rookie cherry when I was making my video about fentanyl and saw the show spreading some dangerous misinformation about the drug. Namely, that the fumes can corner you in the bathroom like they're Jack from The Shining. Here's Johnny! So why are we talking about The Rookie? Well, first things first, it's very popular. Despite ostensibly being about a cop going through training, The Rookie has inexplicably lasted five whole seasons, with a sixth coming later this year. If you're wondering, he's a rookie for the first three seasons, and now he trains new rookie cops. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Last year, the show went full franchise, launching a spin-off about the FBI, and it's consistently been one of the 30 most watched shows on TV. For all the real sickos, the Nielsen nerds out there, it's ABC's third most watched scripted show in the 18 to 49 demographic. Probably due to that boyish charm. Cholesterol level, I've never seen in a rookie. I'm something of a pioneer. That appeal to a younger demographic might be due to some of the more liberal tendencies of the show. It sports a diverse ensemble cast, including two black men and three women of color, one of whom bosses Nolan around as his training officer. Like many other cop shows in 2020, The Rookie did some public soul searching and even enlisted the aid of Color of Change to help rewrite its third season. And the show is very quick to let us know that they, oh ho, they know about all those police shenanigans you've been seeing on the internet, and they, they don't like them. They don't like them either. You are a white man, a cop. You have already been treated with a level of deference my other clients would never get. If you were black or brown, the police would have created exigent circumstances and kicked the door in. Because the criminal justice system is inherently biased, designed to punish poor people and people of color. And honestly, I, I think sex work should be legal. Wow, how progressive of you. But what makes the show especially interesting to me is that because of its premise, we get to see a lot of police training. And the show really walks us through the way they think things ought to be done, speaking directly to an audience that recognizes that police reform is good and maybe even necessary. Unfortunately for both The Rookie and more importantly for us, the show is lying. Yeah, I said it. It's lying. You see, the police department that The Rookie presents is not just a bad representation of reality as we'll see in this video, but one that sends a message that is actually incredibly harmful to reform efforts. Welcome to Copaganda, a series of videos exploring the portrayal of the police on television and how that portrayal has shaped our understanding of who the police are and what they should be. We've looked at shows from across the spectrum, from The Wire and We Own This City to Brooklyn Nine-Nine and even Marvel superhero cops. There's a playlist around here somewhere. I don't know where anything is on YouTube. As with every episode in the series, this video is meant to use The Rookie as a case study to point out tactics that TV shows use to spread myths about policing, with the purpose of you being able to identify that in other stuff. I'm not just picking on The Rookie. I mean, I am picking on The Rookie, but I'm not picking on just The Rookie. Cop shows make up roughly half of all scripted network TV and are consumed by millions of Americans. For many of them, this is their most consistent contact point with policing. So come with me, and through the whimsical musings of Nathan Fillion, let's learn about how The Rookie trains its audience to think like police officers, the ineffective solutions the show presents as reforms, and even talk a little bit about the dark money swirling around it. Buckle in, folks. This show gives Blue Bloods a run for its money. I do not say that lightly. Well, I'm Mr. Rogers, and this is my neighborhood. Before we get into the specific flavors of Copaganda The Rookie is dealing with, I think it's a good idea to give you a broad sense of the show. The mouthfeel, if you will. As I mentioned at the top, this show is literally about a divorced dad looking to give meaning to his life as he enters a midlife crisis. A lot of self-help book. 
but I had the cashier put it in a brown paper bag. I can't bring myself to open it. In the first scene of the show, a bank robbery breaks out and Nolan tries to give police a chance to sneak up on the gunman by kind of asking this poorly masked man to kill him. But uh, honestly, have I even really lived? I mean, life is always something that's happened to me. After Nolan's death wish is unfortunately thwarted, he decides to go to the most dangerous place he can think of, Los Angeles. That's not just a goof I'm doing, it's relevant because this show is incredibly violent. <laughs> I've watched a lot of cop shows for this series. I've watched some about crooked killer cops like The Shield and We Own This City. I have never seen in my life so many shootouts involving automatic weapons on a TV show. every episode, we watch our officers shoot and be shot at. Officers can often shoot back without killing, merely wounding violent criminals with a precise shot to the shoulder or the leg. The world of the show is so violent that one of the main officers, Tim, who you just saw get shot, don't worry, he's fine, describes a man who's been impaled clean through this way. Criminals get hurt all the time during a crime. They don't get special treatment if they get a boo-boo. Fun fact, that episode is about a competition called The Roundup between all the officers to see who can rack up the most felony arrests in one ship. The scoring is like football. Seven points for a felony arrest, three points for a misdemeanor. Which is actually not a f***ed up way for the police to behave because it makes Tim feel connected to his ex-cop, ex-wife. Yeah, and they loved the roundup. They had an epic competition. This contest is the one day a year feels connected to her. Do you really want to take that away? On the one hand, it's really messed up to hunt a civilian population for sport. But on the other hand, it makes Tim smile. So... Who could really say if this is right or wrong? Anyway, real life police officers don't see nearly this much action. A 2017 Pew Research poll found that only 27% of officers will ever discharge their firearm while on duty. And while policing carries with it a certain level of danger, it's not necessarily from shootouts with criminals. Here's a piece of trivia for you. Since the start of 2020, 10 LAPD officers have tragically lost their lives in the line of duty. Given how dangerous policing is, how many of those 10 do you think were killed by gunfire? The answer is one. 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 Another officer died in a training accident, another was struck by a vehicle while being a traffic cop, and the other seven died from COVID. Oh, and the, the guy who died from gunfire, he wasn't on duty. Not to say that it isn't sad, but it's also worth remembering that the LAPD killed three men of color in the first week of 2023, so. And when a man dies, it is sad. All of us will die one day. I'm merely pointing out just how far apart media's representation of policing as a deadly profession is from the reality. And this huge distortion of the truth the rookie and shows like it portray has a real impact on public opinion. In that same Pew Research poll, 83% of the public thought that officers had discharged their firearm while on duty, and 30% estimated that police fire their weapons a few times a year while on duty. Like I said, Lying. This is exactly the same dynamic we've seen in police recruitment videos since the Ferguson unrest in 2014, amping up the perceived violence and excitement of being a police officer. The next thing you know, you're rushing off to some huge incident. The result of portraying the police this way is that you get recruits who like this kind of thing. People who see violence as fun and exciting, who see policing as a thrill ride and are really amped up to bash some skulls. <laughs> but what about training? Can't we train it out of them? You know, teach them the right way to do things? That's what you look like when you say stuff like that, just so you know. Well, as much as the rookie would like you to believe that American police training takes three whole seasons of television, 
It, it doesn't. A 2021 survey conducted by the Police Executive Research Forum found that, quote, the average number of academy training hours that a new recruit must complete is 807, or about 20 weeks. This is a laughably low number amongst our peer nations. The Netherlands requires over 4,000 hours, Australia over 3,500, and even Canada requires over 1,000. Come on guys, we can't let the Canadians beat us when it comes to training paramilitary forces. That's like our whole thing. Although to be fair and balanced, according to a 2018 Bureau of Justice Statistics report, American recruits averaged 73 hours of firearm training, 61 hours of defense tactics, and just 18 hours on de-escalation techniques. So that's pretty paramilitary, right? 18 hours. It's less than the first season of The Rookie. In fact, in a featurette, the actors of The Rookie described what training with police officers was like, and they basically could only come up with stuff that was related to firearms. Training was a little crazy. Gun training, driving training. I'm a bit of a hippie girl, and to put a gun in my hands and go to the shooting range was a little overwhelming. Clearing the room, which is when you like go in and make sure everything's clear. You're checking under things, making sure there's no murderer in the room. I shot a rifle, you know, shotgun, which was amazing. Beanbag gun, tasers. I could tase you, though. Racially, the rookie is incredibly diverse, in a kind of post-racial colorblind kind of way. They're pulling perspectives from all over the racial spectrum. So so when you think about it, what the LAPD really needs, what it's really lacking in terms of representation now, is the voice of a middle-aged white man. That's right. I think there's value in having a rookie with his perspective. Lives were saved today because of it. That, that's definitely what the police are missing. Not enough middle-aged white men. We, we have to do better. I'm something of a pioneer. The first two seasons of The Rookie adhere to this colorblind approach, with one kind of major exception. We're introduced to one of our main characters, Officer Tim Bradford, in the pilot, where he is just very explicitly racist. Tell him that it's immigrants like them that make Americans like you look bad. If it was up to me, we'd send them all back by catapult. There's really no other way to read it. When his trainee, Lucy Chen, tries to de-escalate the situation by speaking to the drivers in Spanish, he pulls her aside and berates her. Do I strike you as a man who means what he says? Por que cambiarías las palabras que salen de mi boca? Yikes! Oh, but don't worry, guys. It was just a test. Everything is a test, Officer Chen, and you just got another ref. I know what you're thinking. Was that casual racism a test, too, or just the Spanish? Unfortunately for you, there's no way to know. Ooh, ooh, I think I know this one. She didn't accurately translate your racism, and now you're mad about it, and the only way to pass your test was to spew racism in those people's native language. I'm not a professor of racism, but seems racist. But then 2020 happened, and the show had to make it clear that Tim's not racist because he's a main character. So they introduce a more explicitly racist character, Doug Stanton. That is the name of a racist if I've ever heard one. Stanton is your store brand racist cop. He loves profiling and using not so micro aggressions. See, it's the kind of citizen I like. He knows his place, respects authority, you know, we wouldn't have half the problems that we have more of them behaved like that one. Stanton helps the show rewrite that earlier encounter with Tim like this. Do you remember our first day out? I was walking alongside the shop. Then those Spanish speaking gardeners honked at us. You turned it into a Tim test. And when I didn't translate your less than PC words to them correctly, you took my head off. So what? I'm a bad cop now? So now you're telling me I'm a bad cop just because I like to be a little racist for fun? No, no casual racism anymore? Not even as a test? Kids these days in the safe spaces. It's my, it's my cop impression. But Stanton is so over the top that the show gets to point to him and say, See guys, Tim's not racist. This guy's racist. What are we doing here? Sending a message. We want them to let all their little homies know that even though we're wounded, we're not down. And it also gives Tim a chance to explicitly oppose Stanton. My last rookie didn't ask questions, and he was a brother. <laughs> Maybe the issue isn't the student, it's the teacher. I think if we're reading between the lines, what Tim's really mad about is how obvious Stanton is about being racist. Like, dude, get with the times, you gotta be sneakier about it. Make it into a test or something. Eventually, Officer Jackson West is able to get Stanton transferred because his body cam footage shows that Stanton refused to help him, and then they tell all his new co-workers at his new precinct that he's a bad guy and you shouldn't trust him. This is not what it looks like. Yes, it is. This is the truth about Doug Stanton. What kind of cop he is. Funnily enough, they, they pose it as you shouldn't trust him, not because of the racism, that's fine. 
but because he didn't help his fellow officer. This is generally how those policing issues are addressed on the rookie. They're individualized. Stanton's bad appleness is actually what drives Nolan to become a training officer himself. Guys like Doug Stanton should not be training our next generation of cops, so maybe I should stop thinking about catching bad guys and start focusing on training good ones the way you do. You see, it's all about getting the right people in charge, even though Sergeant Gray admits that this is a widespread issue that has always existed in the police. So I've crossed paths with a hundred cops like Stanton. This is all in line with the show's generally aspirational take on crime and policing that creatives involved with the show have routinely mentioned in interviews. But like, we wanted to create a narrative that was aspirational as to what policing can become and what it should become. We are well aware uh, that there are, uh, you know, bad things happening out there, but we are interested in, in, um, in telling the stories of uh, people who are inspired to be police officers. This is a calling. On The Rookie, all crimes are caught in the act. Everything is done almost excessively by the book. Internal affairs is quick, decisive, and just, and officers are able to channel their inner Naruto to de-escalate any situation with a good old-fashioned talk no jutsu. Well, yeah, what do you want? Don't you want a show to be aspirational that shows the police in a perfect, idealized world, something for current police departments to aim for? I think there's definitely a conversation to be had about that. But it's important to remember that the show does not present itself as a fictional world with a fictional police department. It takes place within the LAPD, which is, and I don't know if you know this, a real thing. The Rookie's premise is designed to educate an audience about a real police department alongside the trainees. And the show is constantly walking us through the legalese of police procedure. Your Honor, I would object under evidence code 1040 through 1042 on the grounds that it may unnecessarily reveal information, sources, and investigative tactics. If liability exceeds two million, your wages will be garnished pursuant to subdivision F of California Government Code Section 3303 or as otherwise required by law. Per Government Code 3300 and Liebarger, I am required to advise that you do not have the right to remain silent. In some episodes, the show goes to great lengths to prove to the audience that this is not Hollywood. Those people amp up the violence and the guns and stuff, but, you know, that's not what we're doing. Life is hard. Your movies are fun. They're not real. Not like today was real. The Rookie is constantly promoting itself as realistic, not idealistic. And I think that's something you can find in the very structure of the show. One of the biggest and most effective ways that The Rookie creates an air of authenticity is in how it's shot, heavily integrating body cam and dash cam footage. You know how people say things like, the city of New York is secretly the main character of this show that you love? Well, if there was an inanimate object that filled the role of cast member on The Rookie, it'd be body cameras. This show loves to show them off, sometimes in pretty creative ways. They block the people. What, so we're blind? <sighs> no, we're not. There's a body cam app on your city-issued phone. Open it. There really is an app for just about everything. Body cameras come up all the time on this show. Officers go on monologues about the rules and procedures around them. Anytime you leave the shop, your body camera needs to be on. Justify police killings. I think you did exactly what we trained you to do when you saw that your life was in jeopardy. And provide learning opportunities for trainees. I looked at the body cam footage. That was a takedown any one of us has done a hundred times. Not only does The Rookie show us how useful body cameras can be to the police, but the show constantly uses body camera footage as part of its edit, cutting to them for exciting scenes and just to generally lend an air of authenticity to the show. And I think that the show's promotion of body cameras as an important and useful police resource is something that is supported by most of the public. Have you ever seen a body camera up close? No. Well, they're always running uh, until we actually need them. We switch them on, then they start recording, and they go back two minutes so we can catch any of that last minute action. Oh, and yet they're always broken whenever the cops cross the line. You'd be surprised how many police officers actually want a body cam. Back in 2014, following the Ferguson unrest, then President Obama pushed hard for them, spending $75 million on buying them for police departments across the country. A 2017 Pew Research poll found that 93% of the public supported body cameras, with 66% of them saying that the police were more likely to act appropriately with them. According to our good friends at the Bureau of Justice Statistics, by 2016, 80% of large departments were using body cameras. So, 
Thanks for that, Obama. We have body cameras across the country. And that must be why there was absolutely no police brutality in 2020, because all the police were wearing body cams. I mean, body cam footage definitely didn't catch any police misconduct that summer. I hit people with the car. Did you hear me? I was like, get the f On. This thing is. Oh no no no! I know what, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, though they were in front like I'm just like. Didn't hit anybody. Okay, but if body cameras did catch any police brutality, I'm sure those officers were disciplined. I mean, that's why we have them, right? Oh, I'm seeing here that from that incident in Boston, which saw a number of acts of brutality captured on camera, just that one sergeant who bragged about running over protesters was disciplined. And he was put on administrative leave for a whole eight days. But I'm sure justice was served. In all seriousness, while presented as a fix-all solution to police misconduct, body-worn cameras, or BWCs as they're called in academic circles, have yet to really provide tangible results. A 2020 George Mason meta-analysis of 70 other body camera studies found that while there could be conditions in which they are effective, quote, there remains substantial uncertainty about whether BWCs can reduce officer use of force, and that they, quote, do not seem to affect other police and citizen behaviors in a consistent manner. And that makes sense when you think about it. Body cameras can be turned off, obstructed, and will only ever show us an officer's point of view. In 2022 in Michigan, a black man named Patrick Leoya was shot in the back of the head while lying down by police after a traffic stop. The officer has been charged with murder, and this is exactly why we have body cam footage, right? Huh, that's weird. The officer's body camera mysteriously didn't record the crucial 42 seconds before the incident. I'm sure it's fine. While extreme, this is hardly an outlier situation. Police largely face no consequences when they misuse body cameras. It's just really easy to say, shucks, I didn't realize I was covering the microphone, and maintain plausible deniability. As Suffolk University law professor Chris Dearborn told the Boston Globe, quote, when body cameras are not functioning the way they're supposed to, you can try to argue about it in court, and you can try to make a big deal about it, but at the end of the day, there are no real consequences. It's completely discretionary from the perspective of a judge or a jury how much weight to give those cameras being turned off. And you know how you know that body cameras are actually a bullshit solution for accountability. Derek Chauvin was wearing one when he killed George Floyd, but it somehow fell off and ended up under his car. The footage that sparked international outrage wasn't from that body camera. It was taken by a civilian, 17-year-old Darnella Frazier. And you know what the police hate? When civilians record them. And what is not going to happen? I'm not going to put these men and women on the front line and have someone put a foam in their face while they're taking action and try to critique their ability to do their job. There's also very little transparency with body cam footage, and in the vast majority of cases, police departments block video releases under the guise of not wanting to undermine police strategy. When footage is requested, it's been notoriously hard to get a hold of. We know so much in the research now about how body cameras impact or don't impact um, police performance outcomes, right? Like arrest, use of force, citations, but we don't have any direct measures of how many people have made requests for footages and how those have been denied or allowed or what the processes look like across police departments for accessing videos. Sometimes it takes years for investigative journalists to access body cam footage. Please let me go, please. The newspaper Dallas Morning News had to fight for three years to get this video, which showed how cops pinned 32-year-old Tony Timpa until he died. Tony. And even when we manage to get the footage, it's unclear if departments actually discipline the officers. While body cam footage has been used in a number of high profile police prosecutions, like in both the killings of Laquan McDonald and Jordan Edwards, it's far more likely to be used against defendants. Another George Mason study from 2016 found that while 8.3% of prosecutors' offices nationally had used body cam footage as evidence against a police officer, 92.6% had used footage against private citizens. But don't worry, on The Rookie, it's used to get rid of racist Doug Stanton because I guess he forgot it was on or something. But while body cameras are the most used piece of tech on the show, this kind of technology as reform approach permeates the entire series. Officers use all sorts of gadgets, from tasers and non-lethal rounds to this cool glass breaky thingy. And the show is really quick to explain why that tech is both useful 
and necessary. You stopped thinking, kept trying to open a car door even after you knew it was locked, used the wrong tool to try and break the window. Those lost seconds didn't matter this time, but they may in the future. Sometimes they even use body cameras in concert with other advanced technologies to catch their perps. I have more body cam. We should run his face through the database. The message being sent throughout The Rookie is that better equipment is great for officers and also for the communities they police because it makes the police more effective at their jobs. The problem is that a lot of these tech solutions are untested hidden from public oversight and often just don't, don't work. They just don't work. Facial recognition software is a great microcosm for looking at this dynamic. A study from the federal laboratory National Institute of Standards and Technology found in 2019 that facial recognition software is incredibly unreliable, particularly when it comes to racial minorities. They found that, quote, using the higher quality application photos, false positive rates are highest in West and East African and East Asian people and lowest in Eastern European individuals. This effect is generally large, with a factor of 100 more false positives between countries. Yeah, I'd say a factor of 100 is generally large. I'd say that's generally large. Yeah, I'd say it's large. But this kind of massive problem hasn't been an issue for the LAPD, who in 2021 rejected calls to end or even limit their facial recognition program, stating, quote, if the data proves to us that this system is not being used for the results that we intend, then we obviously have to revisit this policy. To, to which activists said, hey, there's actually a lot of data showing that this is super racist already. And then the police hit him with the old classic, sorry, couldn't hear you. Too busy surveilling black and brown people. In fact, one of the most prominent ways that facial recognition software and surveillance technology in general has been used by police agencies historically is to harass political activists. In 2022, Amnesty International published findings that the NYPD used facial recognition to surveil the Black Lives Matter protests, parroting the same findings that the Movement for Black Lives discovered about federal law enforcement the year before. Good to know that this is how the police responded to the largest political movement in American history with targeted harassment. But it's hardly new when it comes to surveillance technology. In 2015, the Baltimore police used the same tech on people protesting the death of Freddie Gray. The NYPD spied on Muslims with little reason other than it was after 9-11 and they were really scared, so they had to infringe on a few rights here and there. While pitched as a fix for police accountability since it limits the amount of contact the public has with police, surveillance technology has often provided just more targeted discrimination. These algorithms are trained on data sets that today we recognize were the products of flawed, racially biased, and unlawful practices. It is absolutely impossible for algorithms based on existing crime data to not perpetuate those same systems. I like how Nicole Turner-Lee and Caitlin Chin from the Brookings Institute explain it in their research on police surveillance. Quote, facial recognition and other surveillance technologies also enable more precise discrimination, especially as law enforcement agencies continue to make misinformed, predictive decisions around arrest and detainment that dis proportionately impact marginalized populations. And to top it off, these tech fixes are very expensive, costing millions in taxes at a time when police budgets are already at an all-time high. Yet the image of policing that the rookie presents, by combining this aspirational tone with technological solutions in a wildly dangerous world, leads its viewers to believe in those solutions as legitimate fixes for the problems they see in policing when in reality they are just used to more efficiently execute those problematic missions. Or as HBO's We Own This City portrays Tariq Ture as saying, We are the people the police department hunts and kills and captures. And you are bringing me a piece of paper that says there's going to be new rules on how they can hunt us? <laughs> so, where does that leave us? Why do we keep doing this? You know, besides the history of racial oppression that this country just can't seem to shake, despite barely trying at all. I mean, there was that one time that we desegregated public schools, but that lasted like 10 seconds. Well, besides the racism, I actually think that another answer for why we keep pushing faulty tech solutions has been on screen on The Rookie this entire time.
When you watch The Rookie long enough, you may start to notice that every character on the show seems to live in a pretty opulent house, despite constantly decrying the underfunded nature of the surveillance state. What kind of a prison doesn't have audio on their surveillance cameras? Sound costs money. Yes, of course. The problem with prisons in America is that we don't spend enough money on them. Think of how many more people we could jam in there with some more funding. As it turns out, everyone on the show is being subsidized by some rich benefactor. Nolan lives in his huge mansion for free because he house sits for his wealthy college roommate. In the fourth season, Aaron Thorson enters the cast, a child of privilege born to a famed rapper. Got a rooftop guy? Woman, actually. Another one of our detectives, Angela Lopez, marries into a family of money, and somehow the guy who runs the community center makes enough money to buy a house. In this economy? You may be thinking to yourself, well, yeah, it's a TV show. But trust me, I know that because I am a smart boy. But seriously, this dynamic is inadvertently the most true to life aspect of The Rookie, that the police are bought and paid for by those with money. Don't believe me? Well, it's been there on camera this entire time, every time we cut to one of those body camera shots. <laughs> Do you notice it? It's, it's right up here. Axon's name is plastered across the rookie in every single one of these shots and on every body camera we see. Who is Axon, you may be asking? Only the company with a vice grip on police funding in America as they hold a de facto monopoly on both body cameras and footage storage. In 2018, the company owned 80% of all big city police department contracts nationally and in 2020 earned over $680 million in revenue. So far, they've been able to easily beat their own only other competition in the space, Motorola, by leveraging their existing relationships with law enforcement. Because Axon used to be known as a different company, Taser. If only the Motorola Razor had been an actual Razor, they might have been able to get their foot in the door of the cops. You gotta give them something that they can hurt people with. That's the only way they'll ever trust you. Both Axon and Motorola have aggressively lobbied Congress to promote their technologies in reform bills. And because of the massive amount of data captured by body cameras, they also store the footage for police through pricey subscriptions subscription models. In a publication for the Denver Law Review, Elizabeth Joe and Thomas Jew note that the privately developed and controlled nature of these police technologies present a number of challenges. Quote, the private sector decides what tasks these tools perform and how they perform them. And that, quote, police departments have sometimes asserted that details about these tools are proprietary and protected as trade secrets, or alternatively cannot be disclosed because of non-disclosure agreements and other contractual obligations. In other words, the monopolization of police surveillance technology actually helps provide the police cover for their lack of transparency transparency or accountability. Oh, you want the camera footage from when I brutally assaulted your client? Sorry, but that might hurt Axon's bottom line. Again, my incredibly accurate portrayal of a police officer. I grew up in Boston. I know what they sound like. Nowhere is this privatization of policing more evident than what's going on right now in Atlanta with Cop City. For those of you who don't know, Cop City is an 85-acre, $90 million training facility being built in the Atlanta forest that will include a lot of goodies like high-speed chase driving courses and a mock city to train for urban warfare tactics. There's even going to be a little TV film studio down the street for propaganda purposes. It's gross. It's bad. The police have have charged people protesting it with domestic terrorism, and if you're here on the channel, you've probably already heard this. But I want to highlight something that's gotten a little less play about Cop City, and that is, while the project is funded in part by taxpayers, about two-thirds of the money for the project comes from something called the Atlanta Police Foundation, which is a not-for-profit org that exists outside of the Atlanta Police Department but supports them doing really cool and not gross things at all, like giving every officer in Atlanta a $500 bonus less than a week after the killing of Rayshard Brooks. APF is funded by a number of massive corporations, ranging from private equity firms to Wells Fargo to, you guessed it, Axon. Who loves doing this stuff? Back in 2012, they funneled stun guns into the LAPD through the Los Angeles Police Foundation as a way of equipping the department without a public oversight process. It's worth mentioning that all of this comes at a time when Atlanta is already the most heavily surveilled city in America, and one of the most surveilled cities in the world. And you know who helped make it that way? Axon's biggest competitor, Motorola who has been working with the Atlanta Police Foundation in their own way to donate surveillance cameras across the city. You know what? I underestimated Motorola earlier. You don't have to just be violent. If you help the government spy on one of the biggest black communities in the country, that'll also work. That The police will also trust you for that. That, that was an oversight on my part. I take full accountability, unlike the police. 
But to bring it back to TV, this kind of privatization of policing is the natural outgrowth of technological reforms posed by The Rookie and shows like it. On The Rookie, it is impossible to imagine solutions for problems outside of the police. When everything goes terribly, terribly wrong, that's when police jobs start. This is already out of hand. Now you go. And the show is very good at subtly discrediting any of the critiques of policing that it does bring up. Well, more farmers die yearly than cops do. I didn't have to sign a liability waiver to go apple picking. That's because you weren't picking them out of a wood chipper. Wesley Evers starts the show as a bleeding heart liberal defense attorney who often exists to point out issues with our justice system. And there are so many neighborhoods like this that are under resourced over police where people are going to prison because they'd rather take a plea deal then risk going to trial in our broken justice system. But by season five, he's completely switched sides and is now working for the district attorney, a cog in the system that he's always fought against. But now he's cool with it because his wife is a detective and because in one episode, he got to go after corrupt cops. You know, I was worried that it might be weird working on the other side, but I think it might actually work out. Don't get too excited. You won't get to arrest crooked cops every day. I hope you're wrong. Side note, earlier in that episode, Wesley is told to prosecute crimes because he's a district attorney and that's what they do. And he complains about how that means he's going to have to go after poor people. You're knocking down charges while violent crime is on the rise? We didn't hire you so you can give everyone a free pass. Hey, got some time? We have a case that's going to be tricky. Does it involve punishing the poor? And then... The show just never returns to that. It's just fine. <laughs> he fixed it by one time going after crooked cops. Incredible. James Murray runs the community center and gives the police a very hard time when they show up in his neighborhood in season three. All right, if the city wasn't spending 50% of his budget on cops, then maybe he would have gotten a leg up instead of the short end of the stick. Look, I hear you. Trust me, I do. But his arguments don't make a ton of sense because what he wants just so happens to be for the police to arrest people and attack crime at the source, keep meth out of this neighborhood. <laughs> Which, you know, is the war on drugs thing. But then James Murray marries a cop and realizes, actually, these police, they're onto something. All I'll say is I'm glad you're on my side. You would have thought one of those two guys would have had like no cops on his Tinder profile, right? Instead, the show continually reinforces the idea that we should just trust the police. You've been hardwired to ask why, but out here the why is mostly irrelevant. Why didn't you instruct your trainee to trust the system? There's even an entire episode in season five where Nolan's trainee conducts an illegal stop because of an aura. What's the probable cause? There's something dark coming from that trunk. Dark? Like an aura. Don't worry though, her intuition is completely right and they solve the case by doing dream analysis. I can't believe that I'm not making this up. Your dream wasn't a premonition, it was just your subconscious processing information. Turns out that what seemed like profiling was actually just her subconscious channeling her incredibly astute powers of observation into the concept of a dark aura. I was wrong earlier when I said you don't have the experience to back up your gut instincts. See, I think you saw the blood on the bumper of that car, and before you understood what you saw, you translated it into a dark aura. The message the rookie is sending is clear. You don't get it because you're not a cop. You think you could do this job? You think that's profiling? You just don't understand good police work. And I think that the way the show asks you to trust the police uncritically is something that serves both the growing police and the private companies that make money off of them. If we can't imagine any alternative for the police as currently constructed, then the only option to fix policing issues is to pump in more money, more equipment, and more resources. Even when evidence shows that those things don't bring more accountability to the police, it just gives them more efficient tools of oppression. This is why in the rare occasions when police budgets are decreased, Increased, the first thing to get cut is training, and why we also saw departments across the country using COVID relief money to buy weapons, under the guise that they would help cops maintain social distancing and stop the spread of COVID, which we know is bullshit because police unions oppose vaccine mandates despite COVID being the number one killer of the police over the past three years. The cops just lie all the time. And as a thank you for buying so much gear with taxpayer money, corporations can sponsor projects like Cop City through police foundations to train the army they just equipped. We are super susceptible to media portrayals of violence and crime, and it impacts us far more than we realize. For instance, here's a graph of 2022 media stories about shootings in New York City compared to the actual instances of those shootings. 
Those media spikes just so happened to coincide with Eric Adams becoming mayor of New York City and introducing his very pro-police and tough-on-crime approach. Now, this is not to conflate media reports in one city with a TV show like The Rookie, but there is research to indicate police procedurals impact our understanding of the criminal justice system. And in this case, The Rookie is reinforcing ideas along the exact same lines. Sometimes we wonder how people fall down the Fox News pipeline, but I'd argue that in part, it's shows like The Rookie. They have an ability to warp our understanding of the realities police face and, more importantly, what the solutions to policing issues might look like. It tells us that our best bet is to invest in the police, which really means making corporations obscenely wealthy off the surveillance of minority communities. Look, a lot of people are undecided when it comes to surveillance. They might not like it, but they haven't been offered the alternatives or negatives of surveillance all that much. This is one of the reasons why activists like Mariam Kaba argue that body cameras are worse than useless, telling NBC News that paying for body cameras, quote, is giving money into the very system you want to actually shrink. The cameras are turned on you, the citizen, not on the cop. As journalist Noah Berlatsky goes on to summarize, if you assume cops are basically good and just need help doing their job better, then body cameras make sense. But if you have a realistic view of how police actually treat marginalized people, giving the cops the ability to do more sophisticated surveillance is just going to give them more tools to harass people. So when I make big boy videos like this one, sometimes I have to cut some stuff out. Sometimes that's because I get pulled into a tangent that might be off topic or because YouTube age restricts or demonetizes the propaganda stuff. But luckily, that's exactly why I teamed up with other video essayists and creative educational YouTubers to create Nebula. But what is Nebula? I get people asking me this in my real life all the time. Friends, randos walking up to me on the street, everybody wants to know. Nebula is a streaming service, a lot like YouTube, that is collectively owned by a lot of creators that are cooler than me and at least some that I'm cooler then, okay? I'm not the least cool person on Nebula. Just putting that to rest. There, we don't have to worry about demonetization or the algorithm because we're getting direct support through subscriptions. There are all sorts of Nebula exclusive goodies. There's Nebula First, where you can get access to videos before they're released to the public on YouTube. You can get access to Nebula Classes, where our creators host lessons on how to be, well, creators. And there are Nebula Originals that you won't find anywhere else, content that can't exist on YouTube, particularly about sensitive topics. Nebula is just a little over $2.50 a month if you sign up using my link below, which is cheaper than anything on the Starbucks menu. You can get access to all the great stuff Nebula offers, and you'll also be directly supporting me. A portion of your subscription goes directly to me, and you still get full access to all of those other creators, some of whom, but not all, are cooler than me. So yeah, Nebula is very cool, and you should sign up right now if you want to be cool too. This is what they call in the old advertising business peer pressure. Very technical terminology. Be cool, sign up for Nebula, like a cool person. And if you're still watching, thank you so much. Uh, you can also support the channel through Patreon. You can be one of these people with their names scrolling by. They're so pretty. Oh, so, so, oh, look at that one. On Patreon, there's even more goodies. You also get early access. You get monthly mailbags. You get monthly roundups. You get access to my secondary channel where I'm a little more unhinged and that might be hard to believe, uh, but it's true. Without Patreon support, I don't think this propaganda series would be possible, so yeah. Do that if you want. Uh, thanks again, and I'll talk at you again soon.